The Alberta Union of Provincial Employees is launching a court challenge of the province's Bill 1. Now, this is the bill that prevents protesting and interfering with the operation of highways, pipelines, and other infrastructure. Many Albertans are celebrating this new legislation, but the unions, not so much. To talk more about it is our legislative reporter, Tyler Dawson, who's also the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, joining me from Edmonton. Tyler, the union says this bill will interfere with their bargaining rights when protesting or demonstrating. How so? Yeah, that's right. So they basically say that the bill is written in a way that could encompass, um, you know, legitimate protest, political protest, strike action, things like that. Because as we know that this bill was proposed back during the protests that saw railway blockades um, in, in sort of solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en people in British Columbia over the coastal gas link pipeline. So this, this bill was targeted in a certain way at a certain form of protest, but it could, I suppose, in theory, if you were, you know, on strike action or something and barring access to a site or something like that, where there was a picket line, that could, in theory, I suppose, be caught by this. Now, the UCP staff and stuff on Twitter saying, well, we had no idea they were planning on barricading railways and this and that, and they really should tell people if that's what they want to do. But um, at any rate, it, it will be a court challenge. Documents were filed this week to challenge that. So, you know, one of those things, another thing in front of the courts uh, for the government. So we'll have to see what the courts say on it. Environmental monitoring is back, Tyler. The province had suspended inspections during the coronavirus pandemic, citing worker safety. Now, those inspections will resume on July 15th. What does this really mean for Alberta businesses? Yeah, it, it doesn't seem like it means a whole lot. Um, the, the government was sort of saying that prior to the decision being made to suspend these inspections, there were sort of standards agreed upon and, and industry was in on this. Um, to, and everyone sort of agreed on how to proceed and how to maintain the necessary standards. So I suppose what it could mean are some, uh, you know, some procedural changes in terms of people coming back onto sites and checking these things. Um, but, you know, it's certainly being greeted by environmental advocates in particular for, for being an overdue decision. And, you know, this was heavily criticized at the time by by government, by opponents of government, I should say, the opposition saying that this is the sort of thing that leads to catastrophe, the industry cannot be allowed to, you know, run without oversight and things like that. So, you know, it, it's maybe another example of the slow return to normal that we're on right now. Bill 26, otherwise known as the referendum bill, was introduced this week at the legislature. It allows for referendum issues of public interest. It also sets spending limits during the referendum period of about a half a million dollars. Now that's more than triple what was spent during the last provincial election, was it not? Yeah, so it, it's it's triple what a individual, you know, third party advertiser can sell. So what the NDP said in response to all this was that this is allowing big money to come back into politics or maybe come into politics in the first place. So the idea would be if there was a referendum, let's say on the Canada pension plan becoming the Alberta pension plan, you could have third party advertisers who could register to spend up to that limit to advocate for their side of things. So the reason this all came about is because the government has been sort of bouncing around this idea of a referendum on equalization. The government has been bouncing around the idea of referendums on other things, referenda, I should say, I guess that's the grammatically correct term, um, referendums on things like police. Um, so, you know, these ideas have been bouncing around for a while. What this seems to sort of do is take referenda as a tool for constitutional questions, which is what it is now, and instead make it, you know, a possible tool for more broad sort of consultation, uh, not consultation is not the right word, more broad decision making um, for Alberta, for Albertans on policy. So that's sort of a big change. Now, the question, of course, is what issues will it be used on? How often will it be used? Um, you know, is are these going to be binding? Um, you know, or does there have to be clear majorities? You know, all these issues that we see in referenda across the country, those sort of still remain in place. But the NDP is sort of crying a lot of foul this week over the introduction of that bill, which they say gives too much power to the government, too much power to the Premier's office. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, Tyler. I was actually watching some video of uh, Premier Kenny and Rachel Notley going at it at the legislature, and man, it got very heated. It, it has been heated lately. There, there's been a couple missteps on the government's part that have been heated. Um, you know, there, there was a big uproar earlier this week about an, a motion that was introduced saying that there should be um, sort of civilian police assistance or, or some sort of civilian corps to help with policing. And, you know, people sort of woke up one morning and looked at Twitter and people were like, the government wants a militia. And 
And, you know, the odd thing is that there was this big flare up over it. And then, it, but when you went back and looked at the debates, those debates were actually relatively civil. So, you know, it's, but there have been some, some hot moments this week in Alberta politics and, uh, Maybe maybe the hot weather up here is getting to everybody. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, too, when I used to cover uh, politics and federal on, on Parliament Hill, though, the federal politics, and you could always just talk to the Speaker, Speaker of the House. You can't talk to the opposition leader. You can't talk to the other MP. You know, same thing in the, you know, the MLAs can't talk to mm -hmm. each other, or the leaders can't. So they're yelling, the poor Speaker of the House, he must go home just shaking, you know, after being yelled at all day long like that. Now, let's <laughs> talk about the Fair Deal panel, which came out last week, Tyler, and made many recommendations, including Albertans who have have their own, maybe their own pension plan, their own police force. There was also a lot of talk regarding the equalization formula. Tell me more about those. Yeah, that's right. Big list of things. So this came up, must have been last year at this point, the Premier saying that, you know, in, in light of the um, sort of feelings that Albertans had about being treated poorly within Confederation, they would create this panel that consulted with Albertans on what could be done to improve the province's relationship with Confederation. Now, I think as we've talked about a few times before, a lot of these ideas weren't especially new. They were, in fact, studied by the Ralph Klein government. They had been advocated for by Stephen Harper back before he was uh, prime minister. So this panel came out with a number of different recommendations compared to what, interestingly, the panel in the Klein years found. So they did recommend the creation of a provincial police force, for example. They did recommend the creation of an Alberta pension plan. Um, they did recommend, uh, you know, I'm blanking on what the other, I mean, there's such a big list, all kinds of things. But the, but the ones that have got the attention this week are, are basically the police and the pension and the equalization, fiscal stabilization. They want to basically retroactively apply a formula so that Alberta could get some money going back to, I think, 2016 is when they would sort of, they want, it, want the government to be reimbursed, basically. Um, so what that's going to look like is likely a referendum on equalization, I believe in 2021, to coincide, I think, with the municipal elections. It will be a ballot issue there. Um, and the, the provincial police and the pension plan are the other two. Now, the pension plan um, ha has got attention this week because the NDP says that if Alberta takes over the pension plan, we also take over this huge unfunded liability. Um, and that is an issue for the pension plan. Now the government comes back and says, well, actually, we already have that liability. It's just, it's our portion of the federal one. So there's been a little bit of back and forth on some of the, you know, minutia maybe of what an Alberta pension plan would look like. But this has been percolating ever since the Fair Deal panel existed. There were some union ads running on talk radio stations over the past several months about this. And the police, sorry, I know I'm rambling on at you here, but there's just so much on it. And the police, that would be the end basically of RCMP contract policing in the province. So if you live outside of a major city, um, you probably have RCMP officers doing your policing. So Alberta actually had a provincial police force like 80 years ago, 90 years ago. Um, so it would be a return to that. What that would look like is how do you break those contracts? What do you do with all those officers? How do you hire new officers? And also, what's the financial situation going to look like? Because at the moment, it's a shared cost between the federal government and the province. So all kinds of issues to consider once the government decides to actually start moving forward on any one or multiple of these topics. What did some government officials have to say are the advantages of having that provincial police force as opposed to the RCMP and some of the smaller jurisdictions like you mentioned? So what the justice minister said is that there have been issues with response time, issues with staffing and things like that in rural areas, which anyone who lives uh, outside a, a large center surely will have experienced. Um, they also say there have been some, some issues in terms of how people understand Alberta, because as we know, the RCMP takes candidates, they go to the training depot, and then they sort of get sent off to wherever. So the logic is that there would be some more sort of local control in terms of priority sort of priorities and policy direction instead of having to sort of go through the, let's say, Ottawa bureaucracy to get change in the RCMP. Um, I've been thinking about this this week, and a pretty good example of that would be in, in the floods in high level when the RCMP seized a bunch of firearms. In theory, a perhaps an Alberta provincial police force wouldn't have done that. So those are the sorts of things that, that Schweitzer has talked about, that the government has talked about. Um, but I'm, I'm positive, uh, should we start going down this road, we'll see another round of consultations and even more discussion on how to make it actually happen. And you know, you're right. I've talked to other uh, RCMP officers who go down to Regina for a lot of the training. Then after that, they go up to northern Manitoba and other uh, provinces around Canada, you know, you know, pay their dues about four or five years. So I guess if it's an Alberta provincial police force, they can focus mostly on the issues and the culture right here in our own province. 
Now, Tyler, even though Premier Jason Kenney said he would never consider Alberta separation, there are some in his ranks who maybe are. Drew Barnes, who is the Cypress Hills Medicine at UCP MLA, said Albertans may have a good case for an independent Alberta. Yeah, that's right. So one of Kenny's sort of very consistent lines all through the fair deal panel stuff, you know, frankly, as long as he's been back in Alberta doing Alberta politics, um, has been that he is a, a Canadian patriot, believes in confederation. He And, and when the, the independence separation question has come up, he's basically said that, look, this is a bargaining tactic that worked in Quebec because they were serious about it. If they didn't get what they wanted, you know, they'd be they'd be out of here. But Alberta doesn't have that advantage, he says, because we don't have any intention on leaving. So why would you try and use this stick um, when you're not going to follow through on the on the threat? And what Barnes said was, well, actually, why shouldn't it be a legitimate threat? Um, there, the, you know, if if this is a tactic that we have in our toolbox, a tool in our toolbox, then perhaps we need to be a little more serious about it. And, you know, of course, this so there was you know, the usual round of sort of hemming and hawing about what that might actually look like, because that's, you know, one of the big sort of open questions of what uh, independence could be. But it does show that, you know, this is, there are some high profile people that um, do hold these views. And, and I think one of the issues that Kenny is going to have down the road um, is sort of continuing to tamp down on the separatist, separatist sentiment. And so far, it's it seemed relatively quiet within his ranks. So this, this struck me as actually quite remarkable that one of his MLAs was going to come out and say that. You know what? Here in southern Alberta, it's it's a lot of talk. The Wegs of talk is quite strong down here. So uh, I'm surprised that Kenny has just kind of you know brushed it aside or wants to quash it right away. But what are some of the big reasons why Premier Kenny is not considering Western separation? Well, he basically says that the problems facing Alberta, even though they are perhaps problems caused by the Alberta government, you know, like pipeline access to the coast, he, he basically says that separation doesn't solve those problems. So let's say Alberta separates and becomes an independent country. Well, we, British Columbia is you know, still in between us and, uh, and exporting oil and gas to, to Asia. So that's part of it. Um, part of it would be that you have all sorts of other expenses that all of a sudden would be needed to be handled within Alberta. Um, uh, and, you know, you've got military stuff, you've got treaty negotiations with, with Indigenous people and, and the United States. So there's all kinds of things that have come up. But, but mainly for him, in my recollection of what he has talked about, it's been this, this issue that it doesn't actually solve you know, very many of our problems to leave Canada, even even though maybe it would be cathartic to, to give the country the boot, I suppose. You, you know what's interesting, too, is that some government officials have talked about potentially uh, annexing or purchasing part of northern British Columbia so you can actually get our resources to market that way, you know, getting to tidewater, I guess, so to speak. Now, Premier Kenny tweeted an NHL promo video this week that did not show any photos from Edmonton. Tyler, I guess Oiler fans were probably not too happy about that. Well, you know, it, it actually took me back to, I, I have a recollection of this happening in like the Prentice years, maybe with a Tourism Alberta sort of promotional campaign that had nothing to do with it. But yeah, so Edmonton's sort of in the running to host these NHL games. And, and this promotional video was, you know, very lovely and slick, but, but none of the stuff in it was, was Edmonton. So you did have a, you know, a, a, people are having fun on social media with, you know, photos of, of Lake Louise and things like that saying, you know, welcome to Edmonton and stuff, you know, that old Cities of Champions sign sitting in strange places that uh, everyone would have seen driving up Highway 2 back in the old days. So, you know, it was a moment of levity maybe uh, in, in what I think has been a pretty, uh, pretty tough and, um, you know, knuckle, bare knuckled uh, sort of week in Alberta politics here. You know, it's funny, I saw this American promo as well about how great the United States is. Come on down and they showed uh, Niagara Falls, but they showed the Canadian, not the American side <laughs> of Niagara Falls in their promo, right? Now, the problem says its COVID mask distribution is going quite well, Tyler. I myself picked up a four-pack at a local Tim Hortons drive through recently. Now, this is all part of Alberta's reopening plan. Some challenges may lay ahead, however, as some parts of the province are experiencing small spikes in COVID-19 cases. The outlier now in terms of outbreak is actually Edmonton right now. So for a lot of this pandemic, Calgary and the sort of area around there has been the, the, the hot spot. Now Edmonton has climbed ahead of Calgary in recent 
days in recent weeks. So, and there's been a handful of restaurants that, you know, jumped to reopen here when the reopening plan began, and they've now had to shut down because they've had a handful of staff members fall ill. So masks are very much a part of this relaunch strategy, the government, you know, encouraging people to wear them. And I have, I've been through drive throughs I had masks on hand, so I didn't have to get one from a drive through but I have been offered them going through. And so the plan, I believe, is for there to be another round of mask distribution in July. Now, the government said back in the beginning of this that the idea was that most most Albertans live within a relatively close drive to either McDonald's, a Tim Hortons, or an a &W, I believe was the third one. So they seem to be pretty happy with it. You know, there were some criticisms that this wasn't great for people who don't have vehicles and things like that. But, you know, in terms of the most efficient, least sort of resource intensive way of getting these out, the government seems to be standing behind it, said it's great, going to keep going on it. And uh, hopefully some of these little spikes we see here uh, begin to begin to shrink in the next days and weeks. Our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson, joining me once again from Edmonton. Thanks so much, Tyler. My pleasure, Hal.